Hi, it's Marco from Moose Marketing and PR, the editor of Punchline Magazine, and welcome to Punchline Talks, the business breakfast briefers, where each week I invite a panel of experts to review the morning newspapers, find out what's going on in their business sectors, and also their own individual businesses. And finally, what's caught their eye in this week's Punchline. We've got a fantastic list of people. We've got Chris Hickey, who's the executive director of HR People Support. Uh, his claim to fame is he once sailed across the Atlantic in a crew of eight in a race of 17 days. Fantastic, Chris. Uh, Dorian Rag, who's the head of commercial property at Bruton Knowles. Uh, we've got Lindsay Holland, you know, the owner of Cleve Hill Hotel. And finally, not least, we've got James Moray, operations director of Kitchen Gardens Foods. Thanks ever so much for joining us, Punchline Talks. That was only my third or fourth take, but we're crack on anyway. Uh, Quickly review the papers. Let me just go. I've got uh, the Times. Travel rules descend into French fast. The Daily Mail. No jab, no job. The Guardian newspaper. MPs, MPs criticise systematic failure of police to improve record on race. Is the headline there. The Daily Telegraph. Hospital COVID case numbers misleading. Then we get to the red tops. The mirror, jab saves 60,000 lives. The sun, fans lose thousands to Katie Price Conman, allegedly. The Daily Star, <laughs> I love the Daily Star. Are you positive? Are you a positive obey magnet? Uh, apparently, apparently you can uh, zap your um, ghoulies with uh, some magnets. Anyway, uh, the, daily, the Western Daily Press, it's the end of the era. And it is. Honda workers are nearly, you know, they're going to close the Honda plant in Swindon. And finally, the Citizen newspaper, traffic fears over new homes project in Quedgley. Thanks ever so much for joining us, guys. I'm going to start straight away with Chris. Chris, what have you picked out the papers, please? Well, I, I, as I walked in to get the papers today, I really couldn't go past uh, no jab, no job. Uh, here we are in uh, uh, in HR. It's clearly dominated our work for the last 18 months or so, uh, giving advice to clients on how to manage all aspects of COVID, how to create it safe and so on and so forth. I think it's obviously the biggest thing that's happened in the workplace for many years. Um, no jab, no job. I, I anticipate lots of clients coming to me and saying, can we do this? Can we say this? What, what can we do? I'm kind of the short answer is you can't have that as a blanket policy as the law stands at the moment. But there are health and safety concerns. I think about Lindsay working in her hotel. Uh, there's the safety of other staff. There's the safety of customers um, and so on and so forth. So you would have to take a uh, you can have an overall policy which says we encourage and support and expect and so on and so forth but uh, generally speaking you would really want to uh, take each case as it concerns and, and, and look at the individual and the see is their choice. Racing. We live in Gloucestershire, um, vaccination started here, Edward Jenner here in Cheltenham and um, there have been anti-vaxxers and a lot of concerns about that right from when it started uh, back in the 1780s. So um, it's it's a rational fear. We may think it's irrational, but people have fears of vaccination and, and so on and so forth. And I think that's what's that's what's dominated things uh, for us in, in time. The numbers I mean, themselves, it, Chris, the numbers themselves, I don't even know, are going up. There are three people really sadly at Gloucester Royal on ventilators. There are 20 people actually on the wards there as well. Uh, it's not looking great. And uh, you personally, can I ask you personally, what's your view? No jab, no job. Do you think it should be? You know, should we say actually? I, I, well, I, 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 so if, 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 if I'm Lindsay and I'm working in a hotel, I think I've got a very good case to say um, we, we have, you know, we are in close, intimate contact with uh, members of the public. We're cleaning their rooms. We're serving meals to them and so on and so forth. I think Lindsay would have a much stronger case for no jab, no job, in frontline facing people, people working in kitchens and so on and so forth, where transmission can take place. Um, if you're Bruton Knowles and people are out on building sites and so on and so forth and out in the open air and so on and so forth, it's a much harder case. So, so I think um, you, my, my view is it's a case by case basis and we take the transmission factors. So we know the high risk factors are indoors in close contact with people. So that 
does affect um, uh, you know people working in a hotel. Um, if you're outside on a building site, you have a much weaker case as an employer. Okay, well, thanks very much. Have you got one other story there, Chris? Uh, I do actually. Uh, yes, the, I mean it's. It, I, 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 I'm. A, it, it's from the Mail again, but I'm a sucker for a good pun. And this is the the the, the woman who won the uh, the silver medal in the Olympics. Um, <laughs> you know, paddle do nicely. It's great. Uh, the Olympics have been fantastic. Very interesting story, actually. If you go inside, um, uh, so um, the, there's there's a, a long article uh, about her and her struggles with mental health, mental health issues, which, which which hasn't been far away with Simone Biles. It's been a big issue in, in the Olympics this um, this week. And and just very finally, um, I, I, this, this was a lovely picture. If you go to the uh, centre of the Guardian, you, they always have a lovely picture. And what, what this is the, uh, the uh, Anything Goes, the musical in London has reopened. And it just it's such a wonderful picture and it reminds me of the fact that in very soon we'll all be able to go back to the theatre and uh, enjoy all the joys of that which I'm really really looking forward to. It's a bit like this show actually anything goes. Yes. Uh, right, yeah. let's, let's move on thanks ever so much for that. <laughs> Lindsay let's go to you please what have you picked out in the papers please? So I'm doing this electronically so my little my little iPad here um I've, I've picked out Rick Astley actually um so yes so uh, 34 years and or 34 years ago this week um never going to give you up was released come on and then, Lindsay, just... you've got to give us a you've got to give us a few <laughs> bars on that then i know it's <laughs> early in the morning <laughs> look i'm a big fan i went to see him i went to see him actually we take that at cardiff in cardiff uh, uh principality stadium Come yeah. on, we're doing it together. Never gonna leave <laughs> you up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Right, moving on. <laughs> so, 34 um, years. Yes, yeah, so, and his and his video on YouTube has clocked a billion views. I'm not surprised. Wow. And that's why it's making headlines, uh, because it's the first one to have reached a billion. Wow. Um, really? But because of something called Rick Rolling. And what's There's that? An, there's an internet phenomenon, phenomenon um, whereby, um, and this is a bit too technical for me to understand, but basically they've managed to set up the internet whereby if you click on something, it automatically rolls into this YouTube video of Rick Astley doing the thing. So this is how it's happened. He's got to this many views. Um, but bless his heart, he just put a little post on uh, Twitter saying thank you and, and how he was really excited and all the rest of it. And I just thought it was lovely. I just was, you know, something which is very, very simple considering some of the headlines that go around nowadays and some of the, issue, the issues that we have to deal with. I thought that was a lovely, simple thing, you know, a tune that we all know. Do you work, do you work in the hospitality? You're there in your kitchen. Are you like me? When I worked in the kitchens, I used to love singing and dancing around the old thing. I must admit, I miss that part of this. When you're in this type of business, you can't really do that. You know, do you do that around there? Well, I have. Well, this isn't this isn't the kitchen. This is my office, which is just a dumping ground, which is why it looks as it does at the moment. But um, no, you see, because um, because of COVID, I have the doors open to the kitchen now, so that I'm go I can hear the guests and I can go in and out a lot better and all the rest of it which means I have to have the radio down slightly quietly. So I can't really sing along as much because everybody's going to hear it. And that's just not fair on them in the morning. But I have to admit, if there is a good tune, do turn it up so that everyone in the breakfast room can hear. <laughs> OK, thanks very much. Dorian, thanks ever so much for joining us. So your first time on Punchline Talks. Dorian, what have you picked out for us, please, for uh, the newspapers? Thank you, Mark. I feel I've gone a bit sober on everyone this morning. Um, uh, Really good articles I've, I've looked at this morning. Uh, three have caught my eye. The first one is, uh, you can see that in the Times, yep. um, Russia and China uh, targeting um, American and British satellites. Um, and on the day that uh, the Cheltenham Borough Council and GCHQ are launching or announcing their development partner, the Cyber Park, I just think it's uh, an interestingly timed article, a reminder of how important West Cheltenham is and the cyber park and what they're doing um, and the real threats that are out there. I mean, we, we face these threats personally and in businesses, but there is this uh, state um, aggression, this, this um, expansion of policies that we've been quite vocal about. And UK have got to deal with this in this post-Brexit world. 
Um, and it's you know it's a real threat according to this article. So a uh, very, very timely reminder. Uh, and I think it just shows the importance of, of West Cheltenham and also things like the forum that are part of that whole techno uh, technological um, ecosystem, I think is the word mark now we've got to get used to. Um, and just, you know, we're as, as a county, as, as a city and, and as with Cheltenham as well, we're at the forefront of this revolution. So, you know, very poignant and, and very timely. I think you're spot on there, actually. I, it's, it's such a good lead in. I, I might use that today when we, uh, when we write punchlines for East on the, on the development. <laughs> Thanks ever so much for that. What else have you got there? So yeah, that's the first one. You said you've got two others. Yeah, I've got two others. Well, I wouldn't be a property man without picking up um, the retail sector. This is in The Guardian. Um, a bit, bit of doom and gloom. Do you see that? No. What did it say? Sorry. Uh, it's basic saying one in seven shops are now empty uh, mm -hmm. in the high streets. And I think with this, it is interesting, the facts. They're saying that 20% of shops in shopping centres are now vacant. 20% of the shops in the north are vacant. Um, and... and, and in you know, my experience, we, we deal with quite a lot of retail property across the country, and, and we've got to be really careful these broad brush uh, articles that really don't uh, deal with the, the granularity of what's going on. So we know the high streets are really struggling in shopping centres, but they have done for 10 years. They've been propped up with cheap money. We all know they're pretty lacklustre. If you go to any town in the country, it's the same one as any other town, and it's been boring. The high street looked... Um, uh, not particularly inviting and hasn't really dragged us in there. And that's the legacy of the 1970s. So we know, we know in the property world, this transition has been 10 years in the coming. COVID, like so many things, has just accelerated this change and really uh, pushed this change forward. Um, so prime property is, is struggling. But then we look at secondary parades. If we look at things like the Lower High Street in Cheltenham, local shopping centres, they're doing amazingly well because people are buying locally. They're going to their local butchers. They're going to the local green grocers. Uh, last week, a friend of mine up in Yorkshire, we acquired a shop for him. He was a market trader, but he's done so well. He's got his first shop and he's doing really well. Good produce. He's got a loyal fan base going to him. Um, so it's not all doom and gloom. Retailers are really good at what they do. The property world is really good at what they do. Um, it will come round. There's some challenges, business rates we need to look at. We need to look at freeing up the upper parts of shops, which we were doing back in the 90s, so there's nothing new in property. Um, there are issues about how we deal with it because ownership is so fragmented now, it's across the globe that, that these assets are, are owned and we've got so many foreign investors coming in because we've got stable politics, stable legal system, stable economy. Um, and so the big challenge now is for, for guys like us and for landlords is to uh, how we rationalise and get hold of these properties. And, and maybe... Uh, there's an opportunity for councils to use business rates to actually go and buy portfolios in town centres, get control of it and, and really lead the way. That's quite an interesting thought that's being kicked around in the industry. Well, we did a piece yesterday it was, uh, you know, Gloucester on the crossroads where, the, you know, the, the panel of the great and the good, if you want to call it that. Uh, and uh, David Jones from Evans Jones, he actually said that around 40 percent of, he reckoned, 40 percent of retail should be cut from the high street. This is in Gloucester reduce the size of it and then free it, you know, turn it into houses, get more people to live there. Do you agree with that sentiment? Absolutely. I and mean, we know a first of all retailing always struggled, which is why we devalue it by as a tenth of the ground floor trading. And people aren't holding stocks. You look at the old shoe retailers, they would have more storage space than retail space. They don't need that anymore because of next day delivery. Um, and we've got to get people back into town centres, young couples, young people, so they can use the shops, use the restaurants. They don't need cars. So we take all those cars off the road because invariably anyone with an office, you know, the boss will have a car parking space. The graduates, the trainees won't. So they're using up public transport, you know, uh, car parks and all that sort of stuff, which is costing them more money. So um, we've got to get control. The planning policy is really good. Cheltenham especially, and I know Gloucester are looking at this. They've got grant aid for converting the upper parts of properties. Um, so the infrastructure is there. Our real challenge now is getting hold of landlords and making that happen. And because of this fragmented ownership it's very hard to get hold of the landlords and that, that's the real challenge for us now yeah a lot of people don't realize actually you know they say well the council should do this to this shop they should do that but actually trying to find the ownership of these individual you know retail outlets really really difficult there's a report actually in this week's in next week's punchline that comes out about the corner shop it's interesting that you picked on that and the rise of the corner shop and the so my own corner shop done it you know here uh 2000 news francis owns it i've done a little report on him as well and uh he's done amazingly well on the on the on the on the lockdown and i don't even know clive gardner from clive and the gardeners he, he also owned a, a number of convenience stores 
in yeah. Cheltenham as well, because he sees very clever chap. He sees that as a as a market as we as we all work from all of us work from home, then we're out and about more, aren't we? Yeah, okay, it's, it's brilliant. Go. Yeah. We're, we're oh, to, we're stop, sorry, Jordan, I have to stop you. I'm going to go over to James. James, yep. thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, James, what have you picked out in the papers, please? Uh, so <clears throat> I've actually, I've, I've initially picked out this one from the mirror that you um, that you highlighted earlier uh, around the, it's one of the, the few positive ones around, um, it says jab save 6,000 lives. I just wanted to highlight that as a, as a, as a positive one. I think, um, it, you know, it, it's talking about um, scientists hailing, you know, uh, the, the um, apparent success of the vaccines so far. Uh, I think it's important just to remember what, you know, where we were a year ago and um, and what it feels like we're getting to now um, and uh, how that is a positive place. It feels like pos it feels like a lot of positive positivity in the air at the moment uh, from where we were even just a few months ago um, when you know when we were talking about the Delta variants, things like that coming out. Um, I know that the vaccines uh, appear to be slightly less effective against some of these variants that are coming out, but I think on the whole, the efficacy of them. Um, compared to, you know, even standard vaccines for other things that we accept and use on, you know, on a, on a nationwide, uh, you know, worldwide basis is still very good. So, yeah, I just wanted to highlight that as a really nice positive story that um, kind of is moving, moving us forward. I'd, I'd just like to say, actually, because, you, you know, you run a, a, a sort of factory there, the kitchen garden and foods. A bit going back to what Chris was saying earlier, would you, you, would you have a policy? No, no jab, no job? No. Uh, no, because um, I, I, partly from what Chris was saying, I think that would be extremely difficult case for us to make uh, when we're not a customer facing business. Uh, you know, we've got controls in place um, that we've been using for a year that have been effective. We've not had an outbreak of COVID here. No one has had COVID in our, in our business. It would be extremely difficult for me to justify putting something like that in place. And from a personal point of view, I wouldn't anyway. Not that I'm an anti-vaxxer or anything like that. I believe in the in the strength of vaccines, but I I personally believe that it, you can't force that upon people. You can't force medical decisions upon individuals. Uh, my personal oh, view. We're kind of moving. I'm going to I'm going to jump away from the papers and I'll stay with you. If that's okay, James. Mm -hmm. um, now you, you've launched Wolfies. Can you tell yep. us a bit more about the sort of food side of your business, please? Kitchen, garden, food. So what's the company? How many people do you employ? And uh, and how long have you been going? Yeah, so Kitchen Garden's been going for uh, uh, 32 years now. I think my, my aunt, uh, Barbara, started this from home. Uh, yeah, 1989. Um, and uh, started it making blackberry and apple jam using apples from her garden, uh, blackberries from local hedgerows, uh, making that, selling it at, um, you know, local butchers and things like that. Um, her and her husband, Robin, were involved in, they were one of the first uh, people involved in the farmer's market in Stroud, uh, which, you know, is obviously a very successful and famous farmer's market across the country. You know, it's, it's, a, it's one of the first ones, I believe. And um, yeah, it grew from there, really. Um, we... We now have kind of, um, at the moment, I think we've got 12, 12 of us here, um, including James and myself, my business partner, James and myself. And um, we've kind of, uh, in the last few years, done a, a management buyout and, and kind of taken on the business into second generation. Um, Wolfies was launched seven years ago. Um, it's, uh, it's a porridge pot. So kind of step away from your traditional jams, marmalades, Chutneys, that sort of thing. Um, so it's some porridge pots, um, just add water, a lot like the, some of those other ones you'll have on the market, oh, so simple things like that. The difference with ours is we've got a little pot of our jam inside it. So you open the lids, take a little pot of jam out, um, and then you add your hot water in. Um, yeah, so that's that's yeah, uh, one, a new one that a new one that we've just launched, a protein, protein enhanced porridge uh, for people like who want a little extra boost of protein in their diet. Can you show it up? Can you hold it up, James? A bit yeah. close to the camera. There we go. That okay. one's got a pot, a pot, that, pot of straw, that strawberry jam. Now, is it? Yeah, that's just come out in the next in in, in the last couple of weeks. Um, yeah. So. Uh, what does it retail for? Uh, that would, well, it really depends. Depends if you're uh, retailing it in a shop or you know in your food service. But uh, shop somewhere around um, you know the one uh, one eighty to two pound mark. Um, if your food service something like three pounds. 
Now, the other thing that about. you managed to do during the lockdown was get your products onto British Airways as well, wasn't it? Yes, I mean, probably the worst possible time to get a product onto an aeroplane, but, um, you know, uh, it, we'll get there with it. It's still kind of, no, it, it, it's, it, has, um, it has gone in there. They have taken some and they, you know, obviously it's just extremely limited numbers compared to what we were talking about at the very start. Uh, so we did a, a whole lot of scrambling around at the start to get it all sorted and then kind of the numbers were very small, but, you know, it'll build and we'll get there eventually. But he said, he gave me the lines because I wrote down here, you know, you got into British Airways and now it's taken off. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. right. I got, still I, on the I, runway. I, uh, still on the runway. <laughs> okay, we'll have to move on. Lindsay, we're going to come over to you, please. Quickly talk about your side of the business and, and the, uh, the hotel that you run there. You took it over a couple of years ago. How are you finding things at the moment? Good, good, actually. I think, um, I think... As with everything, each time the regulations change, each time something happens, it kind of ripples through the industry. So from that point of view, you know, we've, we've just gone into summer holidays. Everybody's saying how quiet it is. Nothing's really going on, apart from, I think, the West Country or the Southwest, which must be sinking again like it did last year. Um, so, so, yes, I think the main... Uh, it depends. A lot of people are coming to explore the Cotswolds, but then you have the total flip and a lot of people are literally just passing through because they need a break because they're coming from north through to south or back from south through to north. So, um, so yeah, so a little, little stilted at the moment, but hopefully, you know, when we get into sort of August, it'll start to, to climb. So how many, how many people can stay there at the, at the Cleve Hill? Uh, so I have 13 rooms, so I can have up to 26 people. And, and what's the sort of occupancy rate like at the moment? Uh, not, not that. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I have to admit, so, so this is where it gets a bit personal. Um, so kind of as Chris was saying, I, I at the minute am focusing much more on myself and keeping, what I don't want to do is end up with COVID and have to close for a couple of weeks. So from that point of view, I'm keeping things a lot quieter purposefully because I want to still be able to control numbers, to control what I'm doing, keep the level of cleaning up. I'm still asking guests to wear masks. I'm still, I won't get my second jab until the end of August. So from that point of view, I am, I am still fairly anxious about it. Not in a, I'm really scared. But just because I'm very aware, people are now staying with me because they're going out and doing things. They're going to Prescott, they're going to weddings. So they're all mixing. They're all bringing in goodness knows what, et cetera, et cetera. And I just kind of feel like I want to hunker down and just be extra secure for the next month. Yeah, that must be really difficult because you've got to try and make that business decision. And the, your staff are a lot younger as well. So they haven't been second jabbed. And I, I would imagine, and, and you won't admit this, but I'm sure some customers... They don't care. You know, they're, they're, they well, they don't want to get masked up. They don't care about the young guys that haven't been jabbed. No, they tell me to my face. You know, I've I been told, last, last weekend I got told I had to get over myself. Um, during <laughs> this week, um, I had um, a group of, um, well, we won't say which sex, but I had a group staying. And um, they just refused point blank and said there was nothing I could do about it. You know, Boris says it's fine. Um, I don't, I have to, I don't have another team here. It's just me, which is why I'm even more conscious. You know, I don't have anybody helping or that could cover all the rest of it. So from that point of view, I know other friends in Cheltenham that have got younger team members are, are absolutely suffering at the moment with pandemic and all the rest of it. But, you know, it is scary when you suddenly hear that a 20 odd year old chef is, is in hospital because yeah. he was, and a sporty 20 year old chef is in yeah. hospital because he can't breathe, you know? So from that point of view, I have no idea what would happen if I catch it, but more importantly, what I don't want is for somebody to go to a wedding, pick it up, bring it back here, and then all of my guests end up with it because I went for business over safety but, just just for this bit longer. But it it must be a difficult thing because obviously, hopefully, you're in a financial position where you can do that. But there'll be other businesses that just have to roll the dice. They have to take that take that chance because they burned through all their money over this last yep. eighteen months. Well, thanks ever so much, Lindsay, for being so honest about that. I know it's difficult. And you do a fantastic job of turf, by the way. Uh, do you want to give me a quick plug? What is turf? So <laughs> turf not is... actually. We don't have time. We don't have time. <laughs> I'm going to move you on already. Chris, sorry. <laughs> Chris, 
dangle it there. Tell us, please. <laughs> tell us, please. The HR people support because you you kind of joined. So it's a, it's an outsourced um, HR company. We've got uh, in fact we got our hundredth client last week. So um, all size of businesses. One of our clients has one member of staff, but we did all the contracts and handbooks they're going to grow and our largest has about 100 so but most have about 15 20 staff uh, all sorts of industries um, um we've got um food manufacturers uh, manufacturing retail restaurant. so how have you how have you found you must be absolutely coining it in i'm really sorry but you know hr <laughs> hr solicitors accountants you know they they they've done well. They've done well. <laughs> I, I'm, so, I'm sorry to say, you must be honest with me. You, you, What's wrong with making money? Chris? You're only saying this because you saw my Ferrari the other day. Aren't you? That's <laughs> the only reason you're saying this. Yeah. No. Um, yes. I, I I mean in in business terms, um, HR has been one of the the, the go to companies ourselves and finance in particular um you you know we had to everybody had to sort all their money and everything out as a as an immediate in terms of revenue and then sorting people out was uh, so we, we, you know covid has been um good good for us and and the ongoing impact of covid all the issues that lindsay was talking about uh, hesitancy what are we going to do about staff no jab no job and all this sort of thing and it, it it's it strikes really at the core of individuals and peoples and people's feeling about themselves and people feeling about others and all those kinds of things and, and so on and so forth. So yeah, it's been good for us. And you know what, there's nothing wrong with being successful in business. I think no. sometimes uh, I think sometimes we go, oh, but the service sector has done well. The service sector, you know, you're still accountant because we needed to turn to people like you for advice. Um, I'm going to go over to Doreen because I know for a fact that co the commercial property sector has done a lot better than everybody thought, wasn't it, Doreen? You, you were talking about the lower high street there. Is it still the large warehousing? Is it, you know, what is it like at the moment? And we'll have to touch on the forum as well. Oh, there's so much going on in property. It's, it's, a, it's a really exciting place to be at the moment, property, um, for a number of reasons. We've got the bricks and mortar aspect of it. You know, what's going to happen with offices? That argument's still fairly polarised. Um, I think we are going to see this return to hybrid offices. Most businesses want to be back in the office uh, for a whole range of reasons, let alone training staff. Um, so we, we're seeing that happening. We've already discussed retail. I won't go back into that again, but there's some really interesting things happening there. And we're expecting that now to start. Um, well, some investors are actually calling the bottom of the U, as they call it in the industry, uh, and they're expecting things to start picking back up. They're buying retail assets again. So we're seeing some change in that. Industrial in Gloucestershire is doing really, really well. But we've got a historic shortage of industrial space in Gloucestershire. Uh, we've got about 2% vacancy. Normally, that should be around 15% historically. Um, so we're desperate for new space to be built. And you'll see we're involved down at King's Ditch with some work going on there. Junction 12 is being built out now. We'll bring some space forward there. Um, and, and so that sector is really good. We just completed a deal with Norville's. Water wells, so retaining those really specialist jobs that would otherwise be lost to um, other other counties uh, or even abroad, but we've retained them. So that sector is doing really, really well. Um, but we've got a few threats going on. You know, we've got the, the government looking at the landlord and tenant legislation. First time really since 1954, the Landlord and Tenant Act. Um, really looking to, I think, level it up. There's a view that it's very slewed towards landlords. And the government now really wants a, an open debate between landlords and tenants working collaboratively, especially through COVID and sharing the risk and the downside. So uh, lots of stuff going on. And that's aside from you know, the ESG, the environmental and, and green um, issues about how we make them renewable. Yeah. Last thing also is the forums coming up, isn't it? So you've, you've got the contract to uh, market the forum. Can you just quickly yeah. tell us about that? Got a, a minute, I'm afraid. Uh, sure, very quickly, huge, huge, exciting scheme. It's stunning. It's a JV between the council and Reef, who developed some really good stock. It's 85,000 square feet, grade A space, uh, net zero carbon. Um, and, and it's just an outstanding development. It's part of um, a destination, really. You've got the hotel there, gym, really high quality food and beverage, the car park, uh, and an outstanding serviced office offering called uh, The Forge. 20,000 square feet that's alongside it, right next to the bus station and the train station um, with, with all the you know, great access routes to it. And as part of the King's Walk development. So 
it is really good. And we see that really as an extension to, uh, or it's almost a vanguard of West Cheltenham to start bringing in those tech industries, uh, agri-tech, um, cyber-related industries that might not necessarily want to be on the cyber part, that might not be a place for them, but they're part of that community uh, of tech uh, businesses. Yeah, it's very, very exciting. Congratulations winning that contract as well. Thank Gary. you. Thank you. James, let's go over to you, sir. Uh, what have you picked out in this week's punchline, please? Um, I saw an article on your um, on your website uh, about um, a new fish and chip shop opening in Stroud, um, which I I like the look of. Um, I, I I believe it's to do with the um, the new. Uh, is it the new Five Valleys? Yeah, I think so. Yes, part development in there, uh, part of that development. Um, so yeah, uh, it'd be interesting to see see how that goes. Um, I, I, I think that whole development's been um, been great in there. It's, it's been nice to see that part of Merry Walks um, have a bit of a, a kind of a facelift, really. Um, I, I totally, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you, James. It is absolutely looking fantastic, and I've been there a couple of times now try out the food court. It really is great. If you get time, you know, uh, guys, I would strongly recommend it. Saunderson's, there's some great new shops there as well. In fact, Stroud is looking pretty good, actually. Um, it is at the moment, it's, yeah. Yeah, no, they've done a great job, actually. Thanks ever so much, James. Chris, I'm going to go over to you. What have you picked out in this week's punchline, please? Well, I, uh, the, uh, um, the risk of embarrassing uh, Dorian, I think the forum, uh, the, the article on the forum without a shadow of a doubt, I, I, I allied with the... Gloucester uh, conference that you had of all the business leaders. Uh, I, I think Gloucester's up and coming in Gloucestershire. I think um, it, it's it's going to overtake Cheltenham. I, I, you know, I, I've been here 30 years in, in Gloucestershire. And when I came 30 years ago, Gloucester was a very sad place. Uh, I, and I think the last 10, 15 years in Gloucester have really, really, really upped their game. The partnership with the local authority, um, the King's Walk development, all the work they've done down in the docks, the university building the new sites in Blackfriars. Um, and, and I think that that centre of energy, we, we, you're going to talk about the cyber park. So, so, so for me, the forum, I, that, I, I picked that out as, as the, the story that really caught my eye. Thanks very much, Chris. Lindsay, what's caught your eye this week, Punch? Something keeps catching my eye, and I want I'm I'm turning the question actually. So first thing you do when the email comes through, COVID is there, numbers, how it's going in the area, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. From your point of view as editor, how long is it before that stops being the headline, and our normal worlds can get back to other headlines, and COVID slips down the bottom? Because I think mentally, as long as it's still up the top, we're all going to think that we're still, with you know, it's still. Well, mega important so what's it, what's your take on how long it'll be before that comes down the page unfortunately i think it's going to roll on there for a while it's actually one of the most uh, click through sections on our website not just because it's at the top uh, i've moved it around over some times i don't move it very often uh, it's also a collection of different types of stories so it's it's a bigger broader piece on what's actually happening and it's a great way to sort of communicate that um Unfortunately, I don't think we're over out of this for a long, long time. I, I could see us going back. I, th I could see us going back into trouble in September, October. I'm a very optimistic uh, person. Uh, I really am. I see the positives in most things. Uh, unfortunately, I think we're led by. Um, uh, it must be very difficult. I was going to say I wasn't going to get into politics, but I just feel. I just Always feel do. that. Well, they, it's very difficult to control. And uh, they need to have some really clear communications here. And I feel they're passing the book. I feel they're passing the book on to, you know, people like yourself. And it, it's really unfair. How, how the hell can you do it? And, and also, there's a very big piece in the paper there about young people. They're not getting jabbed up. Uh, I know some professional people who haven't been jabbed up, and I really don't understand it. 20% um, of NHS workers refuse the jab. Yeah, yeah. And it's, to me, it's absolutely barking um but but they're in they're entitled to their view we, we, we live in a democracy that's the beauty of of, of 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 this country and so they're entitled to their view but at the same time i think the only way they're going to really get the, the you know get it get it sorted is that you're going to have to be jabbed up to go into pubs to go into nightclubs to go into football grounds and then the young people to go on holiday and i think the young people go actually i want to do all those things i want to have my freedom i'm going to have to get jabbed and people who are scared of being jabbed, a lot of people that are really frightened of being jabbed, 
they too will actually cross, you know, if they want to go on holiday, they'll take their, their uh, mumps jab and their polio jab. For some reason, I won't do this. Anyway, I went on a bit too long, but uh, no good. <laughs> That's because there's nobody doing this to me, you see. <laughs> <laughs> I've got over my time. I've got over my time. Dorian, what have uh, very, you very, very a story? Pressure. Uh, lots of good stuff in there. Super dry new headquarters was really good in retailing, but... The one that really took my eye, a great good news story, Ruth Dooley taking over as chairwoman of GFIRST LEP, taking over from Diane Savory, who has just done an outstanding job, um, a real force for good throughout the county and, and, and national level, actually. Uh, I'm lucky I work with uh, both on um, the uh, LEP retail panel and on the Cheltenham Development Task Force as well, Economic Redevelopment Task Force. Um, and uh, what a great um, appointment, you know, really sensible head. She has that business knowledge, uh, a huge breadth of experience and um you know i i, I think the uh, lep will keep going from strength to strength with with her at the realm at the um helm so yeah it's funny you should say that is that that is the top story that i picked out this week as well we've done these appointments as the uh, chairperson of the uh, lep i actually interviewed ruth yesterday for a big interview she's actually uh, a lead uh, piece in our magazine that's coming out next week guys thanks ever so much for joining us punchline talks hopefully we'll see you soon Bye. thank you well, thank you. Bye.